Welcome to the Reva podcast, part of Elysium's Reva Voices from the Borders initiative, a new writing project taking place in schools across Durham and Northumberland County this year. Recorded with the generous support of the National Heritage Lottery Fund, and Northumberland County Council and Durham University, we look at different aspects of the Reva era and discuss approaches to creative writing. I'm Jake Murray, Artistic Director of Elysium Theatre Company, and with me is John Sadler, author of History Tour Guide. John, thank you for doing this. Um, tell us a little bit about yourself and how you became interested in the Reavers. I suppose the right word is obsessed. Both my father and grandfather were keen uh, amateur local historians, and a lot of my childhood was spent bumping around in an old Seams 2A Land Rover looking at historic sites in the border area, in the Thumbland and the uh, Scottish border counties, the Battle Houses, Peel Towers, Battle Sites, all of that kind of thing. And we're fortunate in this area because there hasn't been as much urban development or re-landscaping of this area. So most of the sites are, are well preserved and, of course, have been changed in the landscape. But you can generally get a pretty good impression of what it might have been as it is now. So that fueled my uh, love of the borders, and I've really been doing it ever since. And for my sins, I inflicted the same on my children, which is probably why they, they live in the south of England now. But uh, So that was it. Really. It's, a, it's a family obsession. I've been teaching about the border era, I've been writing about them for the last 30-odd years. It's interesting. You bring up a, a really interesting point right at the beginning there, that the landscape of Northumberland really hasn't changed very much. As you travel around it, all that old architecture is there. It wasn't much touched by the war hasn't been developed. Um, so the mark of the Reavers and that those centuries of history is very alive. Can you say a little bit about key places in Northumberland where you can really encounter that? Yes, I mean, there are actually quite a number. Uh, firstly, and perhaps most obvious, the great Northumbrian coastal castles in Rob Walkworth, of course, uh, Dunstanborough, uh, Bambra, uh, and then the fortified town of Berwick. I think for me, along the coastal sides, Bambra has to do it. It's that wonderful, dramatic uh, landscape this great castle brooding over the sea. And of course, it was heavily involved, really right from the start. I mean, if, if legend is correct, Bambra was the site of Lancelot, Lance, uh, Sir Lancelot's joyous guard in the early medieval period. And Bambra featured very heavily as a site in the whole history of the Border Wars. And eventually, uh, it became the retirement home for Sir John Forster, who was one of the great players of the, um, of, of the Border Wars. He was an English Middlemarch warden for over 50 years. He retired at 95, swearing his best years were out of him, and lived to be, I think, 101 or 102, we're not quite sure. And then, of course, Lord Armstrong himself rebuilt the place in, well, the, the latter part of the 19th century. He didn't actually live to see it finished. So it features in this great sort of Victorian um, industrial grandees revisiting of the Northumbrian landscape and the whole reimagining of the medieval fortress as the Victorians thought it should be, which is perhaps more Camelot than history. But even so, the history, therefore, has continued. Of course, Anik had the same Anik had an 18th century makeover by Adams and then got a 19th century remakeover by Salvin. So what we see with these castles, less so with Walkworth and Dunstory, because they, they will never never got the great Victorian makeover. But the history, just take Bamber first, you've got at least 2,000 years of history on that rock. And um, it's all there. It's all accessible. And the sea thunders by below, just as it would have done uh, in, in the thread of Bambara's day. Of course, Bernard Cornwall's done a great deal for Bambara with the uh, Last Kingdom novels. So the, this feeling that history is continuous, is a continuum, is with you all the time. And in terms of battlefields, we have had a lot of work done in recent years on creating a battlefield trail in Northumberland. We have plenty of battlefields. Flodden, I think, is perhaps now, uh, when I was a boy, it's hardly, you, you have to work it out for yourself. But now it's been very, very nicely interpreted, a lot of accessible walks. And again, we have the huge benefit that the landscape has more drainage, uh, less forestation. The late medieval Renaissance landscape hasn't really changed that much. You can pick out all the key features, just as it would have been on the 9th of September in 1513. Fascinating. So tell us a little bit more about the border wars and and how the Reavers featured in that. Because of the Act of Union, most people nowadays don't realise that there was a long period of time where England and Scotland were mortal enemies, constantly fighting. The borders and the different allegiances of the Reavers and how they had to evolve within that those wars is a major part of that history. Is there anything you can tell us about that? For a very long time, certainly going back to the days of the Kings of Wessex, King Athelstan established uh, an English dominion over Britain in 937 at the Battle of Berlumba. And after that, the kings of Scotland 
had to do homage to the King of England. They recognized him as if he were like their feudal superior. It was a bit informal. And the Scots always said that when they bent their knee, they were doing so for their lands in England, not for Scotland. And that was called the great cause for the Scots. And from time to time, that allegiance was forcibly renewed. William the Conqueror made Malcolm Canmore, Shakespeare's Malcolm, bend his knee in 1072. And when William the Lion was captured in 1174, he had to bend his knee to Henry II. The things bumped along. There was always a fair degree of enmity one way or another. After the borderline had been fixed, in 1086, Alexander III of Scotland died as a result of a fall from his horse. No foul play, unusually. Um, excessive drink, it has to be said. And that left Scotland without a king. And the Scottish Estates, the Scottish Parliament, asked the late king's brother-in-law, who was Edward I, Longshanks, King of England, to adjudicate on which of the 20-odd claimants had the best claim to the throne of Scotland, which Edward agreed to him. But there was one condition. All the claimants had to swear allegiance to him. And they all did, falling over themselves to uh, swear allegiance. He eventually decided on John Balliol, who in the law was almost certainly the best claimant, but then was very heavy-handed about enforcing this idea of feudal obligation. And Balliol, John Bailey, was finally persuaded by his nobles to rebel against Edward. Edward then attacked Scotland. He uh, literally blitzed a Berwick, just about took it off the map, killed 7,000 people, and that set the tone. As far as the kings of England were concerned, they were kings of Scotland also. And that if the Scots disagreed with that, they were not a noble feudal enemy. They were simply uh, traitors. This was a police action, as far as English were concerned, punishing a disloyal vassal. That meant the said disloyal vassal could expect no mercy on the battlefield. And if he lost, he'd be hanged and his lands would be attainted. Whereas the Scots, right from the start, believed they were fighting for their national identity, for liberty. And that was the argument that went on from 1296 to 1603, uh, which was the Union of the Crowns, not the Union, the, the Act of Union was another century. But in 1603, James VI of Scotland became King of England. Absolute irony, after three centuries of the kings of England tried to enforce their will on the Scots, it's a Scottish king, becomes king of England. Bizarre. The Reavers came into being, really, during the reign of Edward III, after, say, 1330. The depredations of the Scots, climate change, that was major climate change activity at the time, and pandemic, had all thinned out the inhabitants of the English upland dales. The Scots' raids were so uh, unchecked and so vicious that nobody actually successfully farmed the land. Uh, you'd just be despoiled, ransomed, raped, killed, whatever. Edward III, however, had no interest in conquering Scotland. He wanted to pursue his grander ambition of becoming king of France. But to do that, he had to secure the back door to Scotland. So he resettled the Upland Dales in the early 1330s, not with feudal tenants, but with military tenants. In short, he found every hard case and psycho he could and put the idea of them land on the border. And they're all still there. Uh, the Milburns, the Dodds stories, Charles, all the rest. In the meantime, the uh, Scottish border society, particularly in Liddersdale, Elliot's Armstrongs, Bells, Crozes, they were developing on very similar tribal lands. Now, these uplanders were there to fight. And the problem with the kings of England, kings of Scotland, you can switch them on very easily, but nobody knows where the off switch is because they live by warfare, endemic warfare. And uh, that then manifests itself on various levels interstate war between England and Scotland, what you might call the Warden's Wars, that's large-scale, local, uh, independent wars led by the Border Wardens, the Great Lords, the Ducks and the Percys. And then you have uh, tribal wars between the various families. And often that you actually have internal war and feuds and, and blood feuds between members of the same family, different grains. Kerr of Fernihurst, for instance, had a blood feud with the whole citizenry of Jedburgh. At what point, I really can't remember why, but he did. And so if the English and Scots weren't fighting each other, then they would find among themselves. And what you get, it's not actually, certainly by the 16th century, anything to do with national identity. The Reavers do not identify themselves as being the English or Scots. The reality is that the upland families on the English and Scottish side band together to form mafias led by local heatmen. They are effectively large-scale criminal enterprises owing no allegiance to England or to Scotland, and this, their nation states, for the most part, disown them, don't want them. But it's like the um, Confederate guerrillas, the uh, bushwhackers during the American Civil War. They're very useful, but you don't actually want to uh, have anything to do with them. And as this tide of lawlessness spread after 1296, it became endemic. And as long as the border existed, it was virtually impossible for the government to effectively impose law and order. And generally speaking, the wardens themselves, like Sir John Forster, were part of the problem. They became the Mafia henchman, uh, Edmund. So Sir John Foster was 
Yes, he was the English Middle March Warden. He was an official of the Crown, regular correspondent of Queen Elizabeth. But at the same time, uh, he uh, was the mastermind behind most of the crime that was committed on his march. And there was not a lot of crime on his march, largely because he took a profit from it. The wards generally never got their salaries. They were not never given the expenses they should, should be by either government. Therefore, they pretty much had to fend for themselves. So the whole law and order system, instead of being a remedy for the problem, becomes part of it. And after a couple few generations, this becomes endemic. Though they, they, they are people, people grow up and have no other way of life. And you know they can't really beat their souls in the plowshares because if they try to, somebody will kill them. Simple as that. So it becomes self-perpetuated. And it was for three centuries. It took very firm action, ruthless action on the part of James VI to bring it to an end after 16th Street. It's an interesting one that you say there, that eventually the violence became essentially perpetuated because it was a struggle for survival. As you say, if you if you took your weapons down, you were going to go down yourself. And that's the thing that plays itself out through the, the, the Reaver play. And it's one of those fascinating mysteries of, of the whole world, really, um, that to enforce peace, you tend to have to have a huge army. Tell us a little bit about a little bit more about the wardens, um, because obviously a key a key family in the warden process were the Percys, weren't they? And they're still very famous now, and they feature in Shakespeare. Can you tell us a bit about them? Percys originally were Anglo Normans, and they had settled post conquest, or they may even have been here before the Norman conquest, mainly in North Yorkshire. They were heavily involved as servants of the king, and the Percy of the day fought for Longshanks in uh, the early phase of the border wars, and. In 1309, the Percys expanded their property empire by buying up the barony of Annick from Bishop Bick, the Prince Bishop of Durham, who was also a total crook. Uh, the sale was fraudulent. He sold as a sole trustee, and he made sure the Dovesky heirs never saw the money. So the bishop just kept the money. So the Dovesky family had been trying to recover Annick from the Percys for the last 700 years, not much chance of them succeeding. And the Percys then became big players in the border. I mentioned the depredations uh, which occurred through Scottish raids after the Battle of Bannockburn, which drove out a lot of the local gentry. They simply couldn't afford to maintain their estates. Convents and monasteries could not afford to maintain their lands because they were being laid waste. But if somebody comes into the picture like the Percys with a big pot of cash because most of their lands are in profitable Yorkshire, they can buy up all these estates at fire sale prices so they create a massive hegemony in Northumberland. At the same time, the Crown appoints them as border wardens, giving them license to raise their own armies. They have to, because that's their job, and give the Percy's their due. They were effective as border wardens. They held the line against the Scots, which is no mean achievement. Against the Scots, against their cousins, the Nevilles, who they particularly disliked. Against the Douglases on the Scottish side, who they particularly disliked. And against everybody else, because they did generally dislike most people. And they, by the end of the 14th century, the first Earl of them, owned a significant part of the north of England. Actually, fair enough, they still do. And the Percys really reached the zenith of their power in 1439, 1400, when they became kingmakers in the usurpation of um, when Richard II was deposed and Henry Bolingbroke became Henry IV. Uh, then they fell out and Hotspur led a campaign against Henry IV, which came a lot closer to success than it perhaps realised. But he came to grief with the Battle of Shrewsbury, and eventually the first Earl was killed at Bramham Moor a few years later. The Percys were eclipsed, but they bounced back. Mosper's son became the second Earl of Northumberland. But then the feud between them and the Nevilles, their cousins, really was the match which lit the fuse, which led to the Wars of the Roses. And an awful lot of Percys and an awful lot of Nevilles were killed abused by each other during the course of the Wars of Roses. But the Percys bounced back as ever. They became loyal servants of Henry VII and um, have retained, of course, their premier position in the Thumbland even now. And the present Duke uh, is, is very much interested in the history of the Border Wars. That's another example of how the history of the Reavers is still living today. And I think this is one of the most interesting things we've discovered as we've been exploring is this, is that whenever we've performed the shows and then had a talk back afterwards with the audience, almost everybody in the audience somehow has Reaver heritage. Absolutely, yes. Names are still with us very, very much. When you go and shop at Phoenix, it's the Phoenix for a Reaver family. My own family, the Beatties on the Scottish border. I found myself that I had Reaver blood. And I think that's one of the most exciting things about the project is the fact that it flows into the present. And we're not killing each other anymore. That entrepreneurial spirit of the Reavers, which it was, still plays out in our country. It plays out in America. It plays out in Canada. It plays out in Australia. 
Interesting what you said also about uh, the Percys and the Nevilles being hating each other, because of course those were the two main families of the Northern Rebellion, weren't they? Yes, a large part of the events in the latter part, particularly Queen Elizabeth's reign, were dictated by religion, which hadn't really been a factor in the early years of the Border War, because pre-Reformation, everybody was of the same faith, except the English and the Scots both support different popes. The Scots supported the French Pope in Avignon, the English supported the uh, Italian Pope in Rome, and the Medici had their own Pope, Baldassare Cossa, in Ravenna. He was Jewish, but that didn't stop him being Pope. That's all absolutely riveting. We talked a little bit there about, quite a lot there, about the kind of ruling classes and the sort of elites and their role in the Border War. What was life like if you were just uh, an ordinary person uh, caught up in all this? If you were a farmer or uh, someone who lived in one of the cities or a tradesman, how were you affected by these wars and the conflicts between the Reavers? I think it's fair to say for the average citizen working on the land, in either the Scottish or the English side, it didn't make any difference. Life was nasty, poor, brutish and short. It was hard enough, especially after the climate change of the early 14th century, to make a living out of farming in the Upland Dales anyway. And therefore you were pretty much pushed into a situation where you had to become a reaver. And many of those, most of those who engaged in reaving activities were not necessarily gentry or landed magnates. They were ordinary farmers, yeomen, uh, freemen, who with their small family or uh, kinship affinity group uh, would form reaving parties. So a reaving party, it could be anything from half a dozen riders to half a thousand. It just depended on who was doing the organisation. And uh, the individuals and the fame or reputation of the individual was leading the raid. You have people like you know, Kinmont, really famous, Johnny Armstrong, all these guys. They were not men in terms of their affluence of the first rank. They were the very, very best minor gentry, more like the human. And by force of character, force of, uh, by the strength of their arm, they made themselves leading figures amongst their own names and all the names that were linked to them. That was one of the most pernicious aspects of the blood feud. If my name is at feud with another name, then all my friends will be on my side, and all the other fellows' friends will be on his side. So it ends up, you, know, you think, you know, the most notorious feud between the Johnsons and the Maxwells ended up in a pitched battle at Drive Sands in Lockerbie in 1593, with over a thousand dead. Probably a thousand men and women at least died in that gang fight um, near Lockerbie. So... If you were the ordinary individual working on the land, then you had no choice. You participated, whether you liked it or not. It wasn't, you know, do you want to be a reaper or no? You know, don't be something else. Forget it. That was the way it was. Different if you were a tradesman in the, the town, the cities, like, well, Newcastle was a town, Graham was a city. Um, urban life was different, obviously, to rural life. You were protected by your walls and by your membership of the guild. But, of course, in the early phase of the Scots Wars, after Bannockburn, the Scots levied blackmail, huge amount, the Reavers gave us the word blackmail, huge amounts of Danegeld, if you like, from this like, castle, Carlisle and Durham, the major seas, to buy the Scots off. Uh, otherwise, they'd lay waste the place, and they'd lay waste everything else anyway. So, whichever stratum of society you came from, or whichever, whatever was your occupation on the place, uh, life was not easy. Well, it's hard enough for the medieval system anyway, but the, the, the wars added a new dimension of terror, constant terror. And if you lived in the Thumbland, if an army was marching through your territory, it wouldn't matter if it was English or Scottish. They still lay the place waste. Pestilence had every reason to fear armed men of any sort. And if you think, when Edward II, say, came north to fight badly at Bannockburn, his army was 20,000 strong. Newcastle maybe had 10,000 inhabitants, so you imagine. You live in a quiet rural area. No electronic noises, no this, you know, none of this vehicle is reversing, none of that sort of thing. You lived in a very quiet landscape, and suddenly it is full of people. It must have been like a biblical migration. The sheer sound of 20,000 armoured feet tramping across the ground, followed by at least 20,000 more camp followers, would have been uh, unimaginable to the average individual, who for the most part certainly may have not even have left their own village, certainly wouldn't have left their own county. It was uh, being an ordinary individual, man or woman, in the borders, well, in the border wars, it was a very hard way of life. Are there any documented cases of, of ordinary people resisting the Reavers or arming against them? Yes. Uh, Hayden Bridge, in 1587, Kinmont Willie uh, decided to raid Hayden Bridge, a nighttime raid, uh, uh, facilitated by the English garrison of Newcastle, has to be said. His 500 Reavers managed to get all the way across past the English border outposts with nobody seeming to notice. And they attacked Hayden Bridge. But the local citizens of Hayden Bridge, men and women, uh, who had weapons, and bear in mind that people lived in fortified houses, basil-type houses, 
everybody had their own bunker, effectively, or their own uh, forward operating base. They fought back and emptied quite a few sands. Since they, there was a lot of stuff was taken, livestock was taken, window frames were taken, they took window frames, they took doors, they took babies' clothes, they took pots and pans, anything they were taken. Uh, but at the same time, the, the, re the citizens fought back and killed several of the reavers, which of course sparked the blood feud between the citizens of Edinburgh and the Armstrongs. So yes, people people were not simply there prepared to be uh, you know beaten up and rolled over by these ruffians. They they would certainly fight back. And as in the case of Edinburgh, they fought back pretty effectively. You mentioned the uh, the Basel uh, buildings, which are very very famous and unique to the borders. Can you tell us a little bit about those and their, their kind of unusual architecture and how they were defended? You've got two styles of building. Uh, the, 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 this, each side of the board has its own distinctive defensive architecture. The Scottish Tower House, very much based on the French uh, French model, and the English Basel House. Now, the Basel House was not really a gentleman's residence. It was a it was a redoubt, a bunker for the yeoman, built on two stories of massive stone blocks, walls averaging six feet thick, with a vault and a basement, stone vault and basement, so you couldn't actually smoke out the people on the top floor. People lived on the top floor, and your livestock, your black cattle and sheep, were driven into the basement by a single, quite narrow door set in the gable of the building. There was no external access to the living quarters on the first floor other than by a ladder. You had to have a ladder up to get into that door. There was also a trap door between the first floor and the ground floor. Today, when you go to Black Middles, Black Middings, another bus, you see st st five stone stairs up to the first floor. They were put in later when these buildings were recycled and ended up as normal barns after the need for defence was gone. Now, such a building, you could defend with three or four men. Three or four men with longbows, or lastly with muskets. It could defend, the, or women for that matter, the women certainly got involved. You could, uh, could, you could hold off an army virtually from there. They're so strong. And battles were built Bit like sounds like a bellway catalogue. They were built as single executive dwellings, as semi detached, as link villas, and as whole towns. Well, with all mod cons, one assumes. Yeah, when you when you look at these places, especially if you're let's say you're in Black Middings or anywhere else, and uh, on a winter's day, the winter, uh, which could be July, of course, in the Northern, um, they are pretty grim. Um, you can imagine uh, just how hard life was inside these places because their primary function is defense they're not there uh, as a luxury dwelling they are there as a place that you can with a handful of people successfully defend if necessary against a much larger force and hold them off until such time as either they give up uh, because they're there to raid they're not there to conquer if they can't get if they can't get access to what they're after they'll they'll go because they know that at some point relief will arrive and obviously you would light a beacon from the roof of your battle uh, which would send an alarm signal and the posse uh, would be assembling pretty quickly, as you can imagine. So um, life in these places was harder, I think, than we can actually imagine. Well, that's an indication. If you've got an entire system of architecture which is based on defence, I can't think of anywhere else in the UK where it's like that. Very briefly, wh where's a good place for us to go and see one of these these battles? My suggestion would be by Tarsit in North Tyndale. Uh, you've got uh, a pair of a very nice pair of battles together, one of which is in, in private ownership, so you have to ask permission. But the the, the, the uh, person who has the house is always very obliging. And then there's Black Midlands, which is just past Tarsus. Um, That's a really good battle. And the the Tyne Valley boasts an awful lot of battles. It just gives you an idea as to how widespread this concept of defence actually was. So I would say Black Midlands, which is in the care of English heritage, uh, and I went this this little car park, it's a sort of walk uphill, is a really really good example. And you can tell the story of the battle very effectively just by looking at this one building. Fascinating. Thank you. We've got a few minutes left. A few more questions. One is, uh, you mentioned that um, the era of the Reavers came to an end with James I of England, James VI of Scotland. What was the process of that once he'd become king? He did away with the Order of the Wardens because he knew that they were all part of the problem. He appointed commissioners, an English commissioner, a Scottish commissioner, backed by an army to bring ordered to the borders by fire and sword and hanging. Uh, he uh, took one of the names, the Grahams, who everybody hated, English and Scottish, they were moved en masse to Ireland. He sent them out to Ireland to Ross Common. They'd do whatever they wanted. Basically, it, saw if you had any, it, it was useful for him to uh, seed English settlers in Ireland to oppress the locals. Uh, other able-bodied men were sent off to as mercenaries to fight in the, the foreign, foreign wars on the low countries. Uh, anybody who disagreed was hanged. You were not allowed to bear arms. 
You had to take the iron gates, the yets off your battle or tower. And you couldn't have a horse that was no, worth more than a couple of quid because so horse was very important. Uh, it was a it was a thoroughgoing, brutish repression. It was akin to cleansing. It was not a nice or it wasn't you know just going around giving out a few pounds. This was a full on war against the reavers, uh, and it lasted for seven years until six sixteen ten. And it seems um, force seems to prevail. It seemed to have an effect. It might have been that the era of the reaver, especially when the border was gone, when there was no border, you can't really have a border reaver because there's no border. And you have one system of law, which are not quite one system of law, because English and Scottish law still remain uh, different uh, different in, in the way they're ministered. But it really took the whole heart out of the idea of reapers that 16-3. It was obvious there would not be another major war between England and Scotland, because obviously one guy was running the whole show, and he fighting himself. And James, it had long been a project of James's. Ever since he became King of Scotland, he wanted to tidy up the borders, and he was utterly getting it. He was both effective and ruthless in doing so. And he appointed some serious hard cases to carry out the work. Um, having said that, after all that, if you pick up the phone book to a client deal off of the deal, it's all the same names. And the Grahams didn't last long now, and they very quickly came back. Their passports, as they returned, were all made out in the name of Mahag, which is Graham written back, which suggests either they, the border, the border force of that day were either very, very stupid or they'd been bought off. So the fact is the Reavers, although they were suppressed in terms of their more violent tendencies, then, but the names remain. They're still there. That whole seven years is a whole chapter of our history that almost nobody knows about. And again, is, is ripe for telling the story of. So the last question I have um, is where can people find out more about the Border Reavers? I know that you've written some books. If people want to, to research, where's the best place to go? Um, I mean, there are a number of, uh, the Scottish National Archives uh, is exceptionally good. Then we're very hospitable people, a lot of good records. Uh, the some of the County Record Office at uh, Woodhorn has some records that tend to be later. Um, the research element is spread out actually quite a lot because the various, the large families, the, the Humes, for instance, the Percy's, have excellent archives. The archivist at Anna Castles, Chris Hunnick, is a very, very uh, knowledgeable fellow. So that the information that you're looking for the core, a primary source material, is spread out. There's uh, Ridley's Border Wars, there are a number of books. Contemporary books, The Complaint of Scotland, which are available, uh, mostly or so Lit and Phil in Newcastle has got a, a very good selection of, of border books. And yet it's fair to say that even though a number of us, you know, starting with George MacDonald Fraser in the 70s, wrote up the border reavers, that whole history is both unknown and underwritten at the moment. You know, if you go to the latest, it's uh, latest in the, uh, at a weekend in summer, it's actually heaving, you can't move. Whereas the borders, you can drive across the border any day of the year and not see any traffic. So the history of the borders and its, its cultural tourism potential is only just beginning to be realised, I would say. And obviously the work that you do uh, with, with drama uh, and uh, bringing the Reavers to a, a contemporary general audience is a big part of that. But And the work that you will be all done uh, is kick-starting the process, but the, there's a long way to go. Well, listen, thank you, John. You've made your own role in that. So thank you so much. I hope we'll speak more. I do hope indeed. All the best. See you very soon. That was author and history tour guide John Sadler sharing his knowledge of the Reavers. To find out more about Elysium's work, go to our website, www.elysiumtc.co.uk. <laughs>